We love it when viewers send us in unique stories, images, and videos. And the following image is no exception. We were emailed by Chris, and we think that he might be onto something. He sent us in a very old photograph of a now demolished building in Hobart, Tasmania. Chris was looking through some archive photographs on the library's Tasmania website when he came across Roxburgh House. Built in 1820, the house was described at auction as a large commodious three-story stone building that when finished will be one of the delightful residences in or near Hobart Town. However, the years were not kind to the building and after being converted into a hotel in 1834, known as the Golden Fleece, it soon fell into disrepair and earned the nickname the Rat's Castle because homeless people made holes in the walls to gain entry and live there. Sadly, during that period, two babies died in the building. One sadly starved to death and the other was laid on and killed by a drunk mother. In 1879, the Rat's Castle was demolished and the site sold to Scottish schoolmaster Alexander Ireland and by 1880, the current Roxburgh House was built with Scotch College conjoined to the rear. The college continued at the site until 1900 when it moved premises. Today, Roxborough House has been converted into apartments. This image is of the house before it was demolished. It's clear that there is a man looking out of the top window on the right hand side and some bystanders by the front fence. But who is that ghostly looking figure standing in the front doorway? Now we have no more information on this building so we cannot confirm whether or not it's haunted. This could just be a smudge on the photograph, but it's images like this that we know are 100% not fake that certainly make you question whether or not this old school camera captured something strange. What do you think? The Demon of Brownsville Road. Since he was a small boy, Bobby Kramer felt strangely drawn to a house on Brownsville Road in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. And as an adult with a young family, he was delighted when the old Victorian house came up for sale. Thinking it was the perfect home for his growing family, he put in a lowball offer and was surprised and delighted it was accepted without any negotiations. However, a strange thing happened when the family revisited the house to measure up. Bob's young son, Bobby Jr., wandered off and was later found crying and hyperventilating by a staircase, seemingly terrified by an unseen force. Bob later asked the seller if there was anything wrong with the house, but the seller assured him that the house was fine, and that Catholic Mass was conducted several times in the living room of the house, which in hindsight was an odd response. In 1988, Bob, his wife Lisa, and their four young children moved into 3406 Brownsville Road, despite Lisa telling Bob the place gave her the creeps, and almost immediately the family realized they were not alone in the house and were sharing it with one or more malevolent spirits. The first thing they noticed was the pull chain light in a coat closet continuously wrapped itself around the light and would never remain in the hanging position, no matter how often they repositioned it. This was followed by minor nuisances like lights turning on by themselves and doors opening and shutting. However, things got more sinister, especially for Bobby Jr., who refused to sleep in his bedroom, preferring to sleep in a closet with the light on. Also, a ghost began to make its presence felt, sometimes manifesting as a black, foggy cloud, and sometimes as a foul stench. The family heard footsteps and unexplained sounds, and found bent crucifixes and destroyed rosaries scattered around the property. A few months later, Bob found a small metal box buried in the front yard. Inside were Catholic religious items. Disturbed by what he had found, Bob called the previous owners, who in no uncertain terms told him, just put it back where you found it. The following years were torturous for the family, and they became increasingly dysfunctional, with Lisa and two of the children suffering from significant mental health issues. Things came to a head in 2003, when Bob's eldest son attacked him and Bob was arrested, although no charges were brought. After the incidents, the paranormal activity in the house increased tenfold and eventually Bob sought assistance from the Catholic Church. Several priests and one lay person began a lengthy battle to cleanse the house from the demonic spirit 
they believed lived there. It would be two years before the infestation was released. Cranmer, who was a former Republic County Commissioner of Algany County, Pennsylvania, went on to write a book about his experiences that he called The Demons of Brownsville Road. The book was released in 2014 with great media acclaim, and Bob's reputation as a public official added credibility to the story. You can pick the book up in the description below. However, family members of the previous owners of the house, who Bob talked about in the book using pseudonyms, were less than impressed, claiming that the story was fabricated and disrespected the memory of their relatives. Today, Bob still owns the house and has opened it as a bed and breakfast. However, the years have not been kind to him. In March 2015, his son David died unexpectedly and his wife went into a deep depression. And after 37 years, their marriage ended in 2018. We wonder if anyone has ever stayed at this house. And if so, what was it like? The Teka Teka. The Teka Teka is the terrifying tale of a Japanese girl who fell onto a railway line and was cut in two, and whose vengeful spirit lurks in train stations and urban streets, preying on unsuspecting passers-by. Due to horrific injuries, Teke Teke has no lower body and travels along on her hands carrying a razor-sharp scythe. She is often portrayed as having long black hair and claws instead of fingernails that help her drag her mutilated body around. The young woman earned the nickname Teke Teke because that is the sound she makes as she moves along the concrete paths. She is widely believed to be the spirit of a woman named Kashima Raiko. According to legend, at the end of World War II, Kashima worked in an office, and as she walked home one evening, she was assaulted by military personnel, who left her badly injured on the railway line. As she struggled to get to safety, she was hit by a train and cut in half. However, she was not instantly killed, and it was so cold that night that her blood vessels contracted and prevented her from bleeding to death. Instead, she writhed around in pain on the track until she was spotted by an attendant, but instead of trying to help her, he covered her in a plastic bag and left her to die a slow, agonizing death. It is said that if you encounter Kashima in a public bathroom, she will ask if you know where her legs are, and if the reply you give is not acceptable to her, she will take revenge and cut your legs off with her scythe. The only way to appease her spirit is to tell her that her legs are on the Machine Expressway, or say the phrase Kamen Shinemai. These answers will supposedly spare your life. Although if you encounter Teke Teke in the suburbs or in the train station, she will chase you and cut your body in half, mimicking her own horrific death and disfigurement. This is one to remember if you ever find yourself visiting the Japanese suburbs or subways. The Ghosts of Petite Trianon in the summer of 1909, Charlotte Anne Moberly and Eleanor Jourdain travelled from England to Paris on a three-week sightseeing trip. When they arrived, they looked around the palace and then decided to visit Petit Trianon, a small chateau that the newly crowned Louis XIV gave to his young queen, Mary Antoinette. But when they arrived, it was closed, so the pair continued walking and soon realised they were lost. As they looked around, Charlotte noticed a building and saw a woman in the window shaking a white cloth. At the time, Eleanor saw a deserted farmhouse with an old plough at the side. Neither woman said anything, but felt a strange oppression come over them. As they continued walking, they noticed two men in the distance with wheelbarrows and spades. Initially they thought the men were gardeners, but as they got closer, they realised they were dressed in long greyish-green coats, wearing tri-cornered hats which was not usual gardener's attire. They asked the men the way and were told to continue straight ahead. Eleanor then noticed a cottage with a woman and girl standing in the doorway. Both had a white handkerchief tucked into their bodice. She later described the two as similar to a pair of wax figures rather than human beings. Soon the ladies found themselves in a small wooded area with a circular garden pavilion. A man was sitting there wearing a cloak and a large sun hat. The place was lifeless, flat and fake looking with no light, shade or shadows and no wind in the trees. The man turned and looked at the two women. His face was repulsive and dark 
with smallpox scars, and he stared at them with an expression of hate. They were then surprised by another man who approached them. He was tall and handsome with dark eyes, wearing a large hat that was hiding his dark curly hair. He directed them to proceed to the right, where they passed over a small bridge. Charlotte then saw a regal-looking woman sitting on a stool who appeared to be sketching. As the women got closer, the lady turned to look at them. Her face was pretty but older, and she was wearing a white hat with light-coloured hair and an old-fashioned long summer dress. Without speaking, Charlotte and Eleanor left the area. As they walked, Charlotte could see the lady again, but this time she was wearing a pale green shawl. Shortly after, both ladies left the area and headed back. The women didn't speak about what had happened until a week later, when they both wrote down separate versions of what they encountered and compared notes. They then decided to revisit the Tryon Gardens, but this time did not encounter any of the specific things they had seen previously. And strangely, the pavilion and bridge were gone. After doing some research, both ladies were convinced Tryon was haunted, and that the lady in the regal dress was the ghost of Marie Antoinette. Many years later, in 1911, the ladies published the story of their strange trip under the pseudonyms Elizabeth Morrison and Francis Lamont. Critics judged that the tale was unlikely and suggested that the two women had misinterpreted already known cases of paranormal activity in the area. However, parapsychologists had a different take on the story and proposed that the women had experienced a time slip or some form of retrocognition. What is fascinating about this case is that both women maintained the authenticity of what they had seen until the day they died, and their true identities as the authors of the book were not made public until 1931. The Curious Case of Robert Johnson, The Man Who Sold His Soul to the Devil Robert Johnson, from Hazelhurst, Mississippi, was an American blues musician and songwriter who, as a travelling performer, had little commercial success in his short lifetime. He only ever participated in two recording sessions in 1936. However, these landmark recordings displayed a talent and style that has influenced a generation of musicians, and he is now recognised as a master of the Delta Blues, and the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame describes him as being the first ever rock star. His unique guitar style went on to influence rock guitarists like Peter Green, Eric Clapton, and Keith Richards. Robert died on August 16th, 1938, near Greenwood, Mississippi, at the age of 27. His cause of death is unknown. No formal autopsy was ever performed, and his death certificate only listed the date and location of his demise. It is suspected he had congenital syphilis, and that may have contributed to his early death although there are some that say he was poisoned by the jealous husband of a woman he was flirting with. Similar to his cause of death, where he is buried is also a mystery, with three different markers claiming to be his grave. The ongoing mystery about Robert's life and death have spawned various legends, the most prominent being that he sold his soul to the devil in exchange for musical genius. According to legend, Johnson dreamed of becoming a great blues musician, but he was absolutely useless at playing the guitar. However, one night, a powerful force instructed him to take his guitar to a crossroads, where he met with a devil who took his guitar and tuned it. He then returned the instrument to Robert in exchange for his soul. Like everything about Robert, where the crossroads is located is disputed, but is widely believed to be at the intersection of Highway 61 and Highway 49 in Clarksdale, Cahoma County, Mississippi. Another suggested location is Rosedale, Mississippi. Johnson's song Crossroad Blues is supposedly about the day he met the devil. So what do you think? Was the devil responsible for Robert Johnson's overnight transformation into a musical genius, or is there a more plausible explanation? What do you think?